I V M. Hey everybody, welcome to this rebroadcast of Shunya One. This is one of my favorite episodes. We had Mona Gandhi, who uh, at the time of this recording had recently just left Airbnb. Before that, uh, where she was working as head of growth and strategic initiatives, this is one of the most interesting conversations I think we've had. We talk a lot about product analytics, retention, experimentation, all kinds of different things, which I think are really interesting. Uh, we'll be back fairly shortly with the hundredth episode in the next couple of weeks. That's not going to take too long, but in the meantime, here's a rebroadcast for you guys to enjoy. <laughs> Hey, today we have Mona Gandhi. She was the lead strategic initiatives at and growth for APAC in Airbnb since a long time. Welcome to the show, Mona. How are you doing? Thanks. Doing well. Yes, I know I have a list of stuff you've done before in front of me, uh, but I'd love to hear that from you because I think today we're going to talk about what growth really means, what the role really means, and how we have all been doing it so wrong. Oh so please, yeah, please school us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hi guys. Uh, I'm Mona. Um, I most recently used to uh, be leading strategic uh, initiatives and growth uh, for A- for Airbnb at APAC. Uh, I actually started as the first female engineer at Airbnb uh, in San Francisco. Um, back in the day in 2011 was when I was young. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've been there almost uh, six plus years. Um, and when I started, um, <clears throat> we were a total of 50 employees, eight wow. engineers. Um, everyone kind of focused on one vertical, um, you know, someone on search, someone on payments. Um, I focused on growth. It wasn't called growth back in the day, but essentially that's mm-hmm. what it was. Um, and then for the next four years, I basically uh, uh, focused on thinking about growth uh, from a paid acquisition perspective. How do you integrate that into product? How do you think about organic? How do you layer these things? Um, you know, how do you prioritize uh, different channels? How do you think about them? Um, so thinking about, you know, uh, all the different aspects of growth, uh, taking user base from, you know, zero to 10,000, 10,000 to a million, million to 10 million. How do you kind of think about it? Wow. Um, and how that journey kind of uh, evolves in terms, uh, you know, as thinking about not just the numbers, but uh, what kind of talent do you need to grow teams like that? Uh, what kind of problem statements you need to solve while you go along uh, the journey? Um, and then, you know, um, added complexities of uh, Airbnb being a two-sided marketplace, um, added complexity of, uh, you know, it being a global company, so different levels of localizations needed for different countries. Um, very unique problem for Airbnb, uh, but majority of our transactions had people from two different countries so oh. you know someone was paying in euros but someone was getting paid out and in in, in INR mm-hmm. so how do you kind of think about that um, so varying level of complexities uh, all along the journey uh, so that's what I did for the first four years uh, of my Airbnb journey and then for the last two um, I moved to APAC uh, and the idea was uh, we had uh, great teams in the country, in the region, to help think about local context and cultural nuances. Uh, and then we had a great uh, set of folks uh, sitting out of uh, San Francisco thinking about product and technology. Uh, but since they don't s- both speak the same language, uh, things were getting lost in translation. So we would build product and features that were like 80, 85% there, but there were just that gap of 15% that we didn't fully understand the local culture, local nuance. And so how do you kind of bridge that gap, right? Um, and since I had technology as a background, I, it, it kind of makes sense to take that uh, role. And so the idea was to uh, be part of this region, be part of the growth story of this region and understand what level of localization, um, how do you think about strategic uh, initiatives from a growth perspective? And unlike, uh, you know, when you went, when we went from US to Europe, it was much easier because it was just kind of translation. Mm -hmm. It was in transcreation. So you kind of just, you you know. Say that word again. That's an interesting word. Uh, so it was translation. It wasn't transcreation. Yeah, right? transcreation. I've never heard that word before. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, transcreation is basically uh, you know you take uh, at the heart the concept is the same, but you kind of uh, create it uh, with a lot of cultural nuances in it, uh, and you you actually create an a, a piece of technology content, add mm-hmm. whatever it is, uh, which isn't just 
translation of what existed, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not like just, hey, English to French. Right. Um, but it's like, hey, we know the concept of Airbnb, but we're going to explain it in, in a culturally relevant way in Japan. Right. Uh, we didn't really need that when we went from the US to Europe. Yeah, because people kind of understood the concept. Yeah. They, they were familiar with it. But in Asia, um, we had to because, uh, you know, uh, what appeals to Japanese people uh, doesn't appeal to Indians, doesn't appeal to Singaporeans. And so Mm. everyone had a different sort of cultural expectation or different aspects of Airbnb that needed to uh, be explained a bit better. Uh, For India, for example, we also we constantly had to keep talking about how uh, this was a trusted and a safe platform uh, versus uh, in Singapore, it's uh, about, hey, you get to meet people from all over the world. Uh, To Australia, it's like, hey, live a happy life uh, and explore these outdoor things with hosts that, you know, have been experts in the space and things like that, right? So we had to actually transcreate. We couldn't just translate. Um, And so an interesting set of problems around that. Um, Also, Asia is uh, somewhat interesting in that uh, we had to start thinking about, you know, we had a lot of brand capital uh, of Airbnb in the U.S., and that kind of just naturally translates uh, to brand capital in Europe. Uh, but in Asia, uh, we want a brand mm. Airbnb, right? right? And so um, an interesting way of thinking about growth, uh, because we are a two places market, two-sided marketplace, uh, trust is extremely important. And so how do you kind of build that by association, right? So thinking about partnerships as a way to grow, right? Mm-hmm. So if I... You know, everybody knows Apple. If I partner with Apple, then the Airbnb as a brand just has more trust right. by association. Oh, okay. uh, and so kind of thinking about strategic ways of how you do that. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is just also thinking about strategically from a product standpoint, what kind of localizations do you need, right? So, uh, for example, uh, in India, we had to fix the Indian payment gateway integration, right? Because mm-hmm. every single time someone would pay, they would get charged a transaction fee on both sides. Right. And that. Right. Because Indians are price sensitive, you have to kind of fix that. Otherwise, the conversions just don't flow through. Um, same, um, you know, for, a, you know, luckily in India, uh, the channels of acquisitions are somewhat similar to like Facebook and Google. But in you go to Korea, it's, you know, neighbor and you go to Japan, it's line and it's a oh, lot yeah. of different things. Right. Yeah. Uh, China, a whole different beast. Uh, I mean, there's no Facebook, there's no Google. So how do you grow? Right? right. And so a lot of localization. So that's what I did for the last two years. Uh, nice. And then. So I've only really worked at startups. Uh, Airbnb is my fourth startup. I worked at three startups before that. Yeah, I was going to ask you about, you know, all of this is, we just got schooled right here in the last five minutes <laughs> about what that was growth a, that was. That was a very long introduction, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> but I want to, I mean, I, I know I've asked you this before, but I want to, for everyone listening in, just, like what built this uh, methodical approach and science to growth, as you mentioned, uh, what what experiences of working in startups before this sort of gave you the perspective uh, which you could then channelize in one, what you did at Airbnb? Yeah, so, you know, growth as a science is a fairly new field mm-hmm. uh, and it's constantly evolving because it's, it's an interesting intersection of uh, analytics, product, uh, and user psychology, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's actually understanding all these aspects uh, to be able to grow your product. And I think um, I think what's fundamentally and why it's become important is, you know, in the 1990s when tech was a new thing, internet was a new thing, your leverage was how can you build great tech? If you had great tech, you'd had leverage. In 2000, it was like, hey, tech is becoming easier. There's languages that everyone can learn. Now it's about how can you build a great product? Does it have a good UI? Does it have a good design? Uh, if it did, you had leverage. Uh, and most recently, UI design, even that's fairly easy to learn. Right. There's lots of resources. It's gotten fairly uh, commonplace, right? And so now your leverage is great distribution, mm-hmm. right? You may have great tech. You may have great product. But if you don't have great distribution, you don't really get much uh, much far, right? And so I think that's how this whole science of growth has come into play and has become important, especially for internet companies, right? So is, uh, how far is this from market, like traditional marketing, right? I mean, like, uh, when, <laughs> no, I mean, like, you know, it is Good kind question. of, it's sitting on top of it. I mean, like, you know, you're doing it in a more analytical way, but it seems like you're taking over the functions of what were traditionally in the marketing realm, right? Thank you for asking that. Amit. Well, I thought I had to, right? I mean, like it is. Yeah, uh, I think that's a good question. I think it's a good segue into something that I've commonly noticed in India. I think, um, I think, growth is 
definitely a lot more than just marketing. Of course. I it, think marketing is a pie, yeah. uh, it is one part of the pie. I think it's definitely uh, the seed of how you sort of think about growth. Um, the way I, uh, I, I don't, I'm going to get, this is going to get fairly long, but uh, I'm just going to dig into Go details because I think that's what is missing in the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. People kind of just surface uh, level stuff. So, I think growth is, it needs to be thought of fairly more scientifically and more systematically, um, just as you think about product development, right? Uh, so product development goes through, there are sprints, people have all this tracking attribution, they understand whether the product works, doesn't work, whatnot, right? And I think if you want if you seriously care about distribution and nailing that distribution you have to get just as scientific and just as systematic about it and i think um because it's a a fairly new field that's come around and just in the last decade not many people have learned or think of this as science uh and i think that's one thing that i want to kind of you know encourage more and more people that seriously think about growth or people that are leading growth functions in in organizations to think of it as science and not as a hack um just a random search on LinkedIn. Uh, if you just search for growth hackers, hackers. <laughs> uh, in India, you're probably going to find majority of um, the growth professionals calling themselves growth hackers. Right. Yes. Uh, you actually will not find that in other parts of the world uh, because it's not hacking. Uh, the word hacking itself just makes it feel like you just have to get this one thing right and everything else is going to fall in place. Yeah. I don't think growth is that. Growth is a is 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 a marathon of experiments uh it's constantly evolving uh and if you are a company that is uh you know i mean sky's your horizon experimentation is going to be infinite like it there is no such thing as i've cracked growth Mm -hmm. Uh, you may have cracked growth for the level that you had set expectations for the short term but it's never enough for the long term Mm -hmm. you're going to continue to have to experiment and so I think that um, I think uh, the way you think about the way I think about sort of growth is is a bit more scientific. Uh, it's a thought out process, and um, you know it is a combination of um, you know qualitative uh, qualitative modeling, quantitative modeling, and then sort of along the way, how do you build these mini models so you know you're on the path to your north star, right? Mm-hmm. And so, in terms of the qualitative modeling, I think. Uh, I think the fundamental question as a CEO and the founder of the company that you should ask is, how is our product going to grow, right? Um, And you'll be surprised, even if you have a team of five people and you ask that question, every single one of us is probably going to give you a different answer. Okay. Uh, And that in itself is a fundamental challenge because then that means you guys are not firstly aligned on how the company is going to grow. Secondly, uh, it's hard to prioritize because everyone is is on their own agenda. Mm -hmm. Uh, and third, uh, there's no common sort of um, prioritization scale of how you allocate resources. And so you may end up being spread too thin uh, and not make enough progress. So going back to the question you were saying about marketing, um, uh, when you start to ask the question of how your company is going to grow, uh, marketing is definitely one of the question, one of the, yeah. the seed channels of how you start, right? Because uh, it, there's three advantages to marketing. One is that you can buy distribution. Mm. Uh, so as long as you have money in the bank, you can do something with it. Uh, second, it's instant, right? Mm-hmm. So you're going to start to see some traction straight right off the bat. Right. Um, and that's actually f- that's actually a key requirement for a startup because otherwise you just don't know if it's working or not working, right? right? Uh, so it's a great way to find if there's product market fit, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then third is, I think, uh, with digital ads, you've gotten fairly good with tracking and attribution. And so it really helps you understand what your user base is and what the level of engagement is and all that kind of stuff, right? So it's a it's a quick way to get there. Um, but I think it's only as good as your retention engine is, right? Because you, you may keep spending money at the top of the funnel, but if you have a leaky bucket, uh, there's no point. Uh, you're going to run out of it before you know it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as more time and again we have seen in a lot of examples around us. Yeah, but uh, but it's also a common myth, uh, which is, hey, retention is this metric that the growth team has to focus on. Yeah. Right? Or retention is something I'll deal after I have growth. Yep. Uh, and okay, yeah, that strikes me as uh, short-sighted, but okay. 
No, but, but it, that it, is it, how people think here. I think. Uh, I mean, a lot of people. I've actually heard this time yeah. and again. Um, I've definitely heard the first one, which is, "Hey, retention is not my problem. Retention is a problem of the grow team. As product, I don't need to. I don't need to wor- worry about it." So, I mean, retention. If you like, just translate it into maybe this is my you know market like lingo of people heavily used by growth professionals, but. If you just break down the word retention, all it's saying is how valuable is your product and yeah, does it continue to give value over and over yeah, again, right? right? Mm-hmm. And so as a product individual, if you stop caring about it, there's a problem. That strikes me as like… Bizarre. <laughs> yeah, no, it strikes me as dumb, honestly, because I mean like how do you know – yeah, how do you know how valuable your customer is if you can't keep him, right? If it's just a question of bringing him in and losing, losing them immediately, yeah. how, uh, what, what, how do you get it? And it is the product the, person's job to, to worry about that. Yeah. And I, I and I would I would have hoped more people to have cared about that before um, over anything else because unless you have retention, uh, you can't really do anything else. Yeah, and all the marketing in the world is kind of you're you're not uh, if you're doing a lot of acquisition and I mean like to, today there's a cost to acquire a customer right mm-hmm. so I mean like if you're doing a lot of customer acquisition if they're all falling off on the back end then I mean like there it seems like you're wasting your money. You are, but. Um, yeah. You know, it also depends on how you can attract that, right? Because some people, um, that's that's also a common um, challenge with uh, startups that are only really starting to think about growth, haven't really thought about it uh, deep and hard, is uh, they just look at metrics like, hey, how many new users are I acquiring? Uh, how many uh, monthly visitors am I getting? How many unique monthly visitors right. am I getting, right? And so if that number continues to grow, they're like, oh my God, I'm getting 3x growth month over month. I'm, you know, my company is like, on this track, I'm going to go raise uh, a bunch of money and <laughs> life never ends because they just continue bu- raising a bunch of money on those metrics. And right. Luckily, the investors are getting smart and people understand that retention is an important mm-hmm. metric to think about. But um, there are still some businesses that just thrive on new users. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure there are some places where that makes sense as well, right? But I can't think of that many. It, it feels like it's cheaper to keep your existing customer than it would be to go out and get a new customer every year. Actually, I don't know. I don't think I. I mean, I've I've tried to study this space uh, for a fair amount of time. Mm. I don't think there's any startup I've seen that has gone to any meaningful success without focusing on retention mm. and only focusing on new users. I literally no, have. I'm pretty zero. sure there isn't. But and this exact fact which you just mentioned, right? It's cheaper to retain existing customers is mm. something which we all say this, and again. I'm putting myself in the same bucket that we all think this way maybe at some level, especially if you read blog posts about growth <laughs> and if you read all these other data sources so that yeah. there are so many of... If you follow so Sheila Ditya Twitter feed. Yeah. <laughs> okay then. Uh, but the point is, uh, in practicality, when it comes to uh, executing, right? When you have a team, let's say you're those five people starting out, you're scrappy, you don't know what to do, you're, you know throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks. And then one day you have money and suddenly you say, oh, I must use this to show my numbers going up. So let us just use all the money in acquisition. And then that becomes a habit is what I think happens with people. I think it becomes a habit, but also, you know, just to be fair to the It's this insecurity of like, what if I shut this off and then my numbers go away? What will happen then? Yeah, I think, uh, but also to be fair to founders, I think, uh, you know, the challenge is the ecosystem hasn't evolved to the point where uh, investors will keep giving you money uh, without getting some key metrics back, right? And so Facebook was able to raise billions until it made a dime. Yeah. That situation will, hasn't evolved in India. And so for people in India, founders in India, companies in India, they're like, okay, there are some vanity metrics I have to get right. uh, to continue raising money and continue surviving, uh, which is unfortunately the, the, the true state of the, the ecosystem, right? But having said that, I think um, you'll always see um, uh, companies that um, do moderately well to companies that do really well. Are uh, The difference is retention, um, always. Yeah. Uh, I think if you focus only on acquisition without retention, uh, it's a you know it's the fight to the bottom. Yeah, and there's and people always put this away for later. Like when you, the example you gave that it's not my problem, it's the growth team's problem. Uh, most people don't have a growth team until much later, uh, yeah. or at least one which really works or knows what it's doing. Yeah, and uh, we're always in that first few. Uh, cycles of raising funds and growing you're always thinking acquisition acquisition let me increase the top of the funnel as much as I can 
and we'll see about retention later so yeah do you think we've just not seen a, a mature enough companies in the country so far it's everyone is at this early to middle sort of a stage and is like even the flip cards of the world are or maybe right they are the only ones probably hopefully worrying about retaining oh, users oh i think there's a few companies right there's companies like zomato there's companies like ola there's companies like flip card i think they definitely should be worrying about retention mm-hmm. um i think it's a combination of uh, things um and i is this going back to some misunderstandings and myths that i see in the ecosystem uh firstly everyone thinks if you think about retention they have to think about app like i don't have an app there's no way i can retain because i can't send no- notifications and mm-hmm. i'm i mean there's no way i can get to the user because most of these companies you can use the product without logging in so i have no information about this user so how do i retain how do i engage right um uh i think the second part of it is i think um like i said uh it, unlike successful companies and exa- using them as examples uh, outside of india retention is essentially finding product market fit mm-hmm. and companies elsewhere try to find product market fit before building a growth team mm-hmm. uh, in india it's actually the other way yeah it's like it's i like, got all these people in this room they are my growth to- team <laughs> and they're going to figure out retention <laughs> So it's almost uh you know it, it, the 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 order of these things is uh yeah. not what you typically see in in more evolved markets where growth is thought of as a science. Right. Uh here it's like hey I have this one guy. This is my growth team and the head of the growth team is the one who knows how to optimize Facebook ads. Right. Uh <laughs> and uh I mean I'm not uh, and it, social media and uh, um yeah and um uh, you know send uh, push notifications. somewhat uh, <laughs> if i have an app uh, <laughs> or, or he's responsible for designing that app uh, but uh, that's what i'm saying so i think uh, i think the fundamental thing that is kind of missing in this ecosystem is i think an understanding of firstly what does a growth team do uh, what is the right time for the growth team to be formed and what are essential aspects of the growth team uh, in terms of skill sets in terms of mentality in terms of uh, you know uh, nuances you need uh, as members of the uh, of the the grow team to be able to actually succeed right uh, i think uh, again i don't think it's a i think it's just a matter of time it's just a fairly new uh, discipline even elsewhere in the world it just hasn't gotten to here because there aren't that many companies that have such challenges but i think as more and more uh, internet companies are created uh, like i said great tech great product is no longer a leverage great distribution yeah. is and so right. how do you build that right and right. so that's going to start to become more and more meaningful in the next few years right in fact uh, i think that's exactly what i want to uh, talk to you about as what can you give us as an insight on what that framework really is but i think we're going to take a quick break and come back Hello everybody, welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please make sure you do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. One more reminder, we are still hiring. We're looking for producers, content creators, audio engineers, developers, and basically all kinds of people. Go on to our careers page, ivmpodcast.com slash careers and apply. Please send us your resume and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Also wanted to make a note to you all that, hey, if you are listening to us and you hear something you like, take a screenshot of what you're doing, send it to us on social media, tag us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or wherever, and we'll repost you on our own page. This week, your favorite fitness podcaster, Urmi Kothari, is back with season two of the Kinetic Living podcast. Urmi is doing two bite-sized episodes every week, Tabata Tuesdays, which will be a four-minute workout, and a second called Thriving Thursdays, where Urmi will share motivating personal experiences of challenges she's faced. On Cyrus Says, actor and improviser Mukul Chadda talks to Cyrus about his central role in the Indian adaptation of The Office, the process of adapting the scripts, and how he went from being a research analyst in New York to an actor and improviser in Mumbai. On the first episode of Tech Careers in the New, presented by Accenture, Sheila Ditya is in conversation with Sanjeev Narsipur. He's the managing director and blockchain lead at Accenture Technology Services, and they talk about blockchain, its real-world practical applications, and what it takes to have a career in this space. On IBM Likes, IBM staffers delve deeper into the universe of independent and parallel cinema. On the Habit Coach, Ashton talks about never missing Mondays. He also talks about maintaining the momentum and owning that habit. On ATKT Talent, Ted Peeman and Krupa are joined by Sai, a rapper, and Kala, a music producer and rapper. They talk about their ATKT journey, the first songs they composed and produced together, and collaborations with other rappers. On Not Just Dance, Ak Parsan talks to Roxanne Bambot and Maruk Mogrelia about immersive Parsi food experiences like Parsi food walks and home dining. 
on What a Player, Siddharth, Mikhail and Akash review the previous week of the ongoing ICC Cricket World Cup, preview the upcoming week along with some unusual predictions and give out their What a Player of the Week. On the Pragati Podcast, Pranay Kotasthane returns to help us understand how fiscal federalism works in India. And with that, let's continue on with your show. All right, welcome back, guys. And uh, I think uh, after that session on schooling us, uh, we <laughs> still have a lot of questions to ask you, Mona. Uh, and but before before I get into uh, you know what what growth exactly is, I think that's the answer what we're looking for. I want to ask you about this one time where you worked in a company which had the domain socialmedia dot com, and was that where you learned all of this? A uh, lot, fair bit of it, uh, uh-huh. but yeah, it's an interesting story. So I worked at a startup called SocialMedia. dot com between two thousand eight and two thousand ten. When uh, it was known, what social media was called? Uh, just barely. Twitter had started to get somewhat mainstream in two thousand seven. So uh, obviously, yeah. I mean, having the domain SocialMedia. dot com is a big deal, and we only had that domain because it was registered by the wife of the co-founder in nineteen ninety four. Wow! <laughs> so you know the real visionary there. <laughs> wow! Uh, so yeah, yeah, we have to thank her. Yeah, yeah and uh, basically, uh, it the company did um, ads before there were ads on Facebook and Twitter and MySpace. Uh, we went zero to one hundred million in revenue in less than 12 months and wow. went the other direction just as quickly. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just because Facebook realized that they were sitting on a gold mine mm-hmm. uh, and they uh, sort of cut off all the API access for developer platforms and stuff like that. So. Wow. This is actually not the first time we've heard a story like this, especially I think we had uh, someone Namit. else, Namit, uh, yeah. mentioned about Facebook, using Facebook as a platform for e-commerce yeah. and even that got cut off at some point. Same so for I, Twitter, right? Twitter was exactly. the most. Uh, Twitter was actually the most abrupt uh, platform on planet Earth. I think. Yeah. It's just yeah and now, uh, till recently, we also saw the same thing with Instagram. Instagram just switched off a lot of their APIs. I think this whole ecosystem, once it grows, grows large enough, they yeah. figure out. Uh, what's, yeah. How to make money? Or they, or they run out of growth hacks. They figure out. Okay, all right. Someone else has figured it out. <laughs> yes. Let's just copy. It, get inspired. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not copied. But but yeah, you have been at a bunch <laughs> of uh, fun uh, startups, and all of them have got acquired. They have. So it's like that's a pretty impressive track record. You I have know. There. I could become a VC, huh? I know. <laughs> <laughs> you could literally. Actually, just say I am one, and, and they would give you the job. Uh, sure, yeah, uh, yeah. I've been fairly lucky, uh, although, you know, they've gone through acquisitions. Some of them have been uh, sort of a talent acquisition as part of uh, mm-hmm. something interesting we've built. Some of them have been meaningful businesses that have sort of continued to scale. Um, so, flavor of everything, and I think. The biggest sort of uh, aspect of working at startups has been just how fast you can run and how fast you can learn. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, I think I drank too much of that Kool-Aid and I've just constantly just been at <laughs> startups. So, um, yeah, I once had an opportunity to work at Google, but I decided to take Airbnb. So I think I think it was a great plan. In hindsight, yes, but not when I did it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it might have seemed so. But again, that's where I guess... You can talk to us about how, what growth means. What growth means when you are a hundred first hundred customers. What growth means when you have a million customers. So, what is this? What what can you tell us in as much detail as you can uh, about wow. what this really means? Because I think that's something. I, I, if you have to start thinking about growth as a science, we have to go beyond just blog posts and basic books. You have to. I think it's a lot of first principles thinking as the saying is right i think that's also applied the same thing applied to growth and not growth hacking yeah and uh, i think everyone in this universe should stop using the word growth hacking because honestly there is no such thing as hacking growth it yeah. is it's a marathon of sprints and if you are not if you don't have that mindset you're not uh, you're not really going to see the full potential of the opportunity mm-hmm. you're trying to uh, leverage um so yeah, maybe uh, let's start with something basic. Um, firstly, what is growth, right? Um, I think growth is equal to distribution. Okay. Uh, it comes from a variety of different sources. Uh, marketing is one of them. Okay. But essentially, um, you know, if you were to think about uh, the way I would think about growth is, what kind of tactics can you use from a distribution standpoint? Uh, that give you compounded interest over a long period of time, right? Okay. So what do you do today um, that get helps you get one cohort of users 
that then lets you get a larger different cohort of users and that cycle just continues to oh. compound and I mean, if you were to think about the financial sort of analogy to it, it's like if I put some principle, which is the growth tactics today that I, the experiments that I run today, the, the, the insights I have today, how do they give me compound interest over a long period of times? Mm-hmm. Um, and what along the way, how can I continue to increase this principal amount, right? And so right. as they get, as a company evolves and matures over a number of years, how they even those new principal amounts continue to give me more compounded yeah. interest. Uh, I think that's how I think about growth. Uh, okay. And that's why uh, the point I was making is people should stop using the word hacking because it, firstly, it feels like it's a state of mind for a very short time. Okay. Uh, and secondly, uh, it feels like... Um, it implies a single answer. Single answer. And it, I, I think it also implies that um, you can have... Just stop thinking about it. You do it once, yeah. and if you get it right, you just stop thinking about it. And yeah, that's and it'll just take complete, off from there. Yeah, and that's the complete opposite of growth, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, because, uh, you know, growth is going to continue to evolve, uh, and there are a variety of reasons it will continue to evolve. One is the scale of your own business, right? As you continue to grow, you're going to kind of plateau the existing TAM that you're going after, you're going to have to find some other sort of mm-hmm. adjacent opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, second is there's going to be competition in the market, so you're going to fi- have to find what your differentiator is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then third is um, the usage of the product will evolve. So uh, as the usage of the product evolves, how you address these users and how do you make your product more valuable is going to differ, right? How you introduce them to the product is going to differ. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think it's a... Uh, uh, you know, just as you don't think of product as a hack, you can't think of growth as a hack. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, um, so I think that's how I think about growth. Uh, in terms of framework, um, I, I kind of break it down into uh, sort of four main buckets, right? Uh, one is, uh, one aspect of growth is acquisition. Second aspect of growth is retention. The third aspect of growth is seeding any product, right? So what are your channels that just help get people in the door and then okay. it's up to your uh, either the acquisition or your retention to continue to multiply that okay. right um, and then the fourth is what uh, how do you quantify your growth multipliers mm-hmm. uh, so you know how to prioritize uh, the kinds of efforts that are in the pipeline right because that as a startup you're always going to have limited resources in terms of engineering in terms of product in terms of design okay um, and so if you have a good understanding of these four aspects um, uh, I think what it helps you do is one, uh, it helps align the team on what you want to work on. Second, it helps you communicate and sort of check on progress fairly easily. You're not sort of always being reactive to growth, right? right. You see, hey, Flipkart just this thing on growth hack and suddenly the numbers are up. Let me try this. Right. Uh, if you have a larger plan for your, you know, like a 12, 18 month plan, you're not going to get uh, sidetracked, and, sidetracked with, yeah. you know, uh, uh, which are fairly, uh, you know, it's a human nature to sort of get sidetracked by things right. that are working for other companies, right? So, um, oh, food tech is great. Let me buy a food tech company. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, Paytm is doing cashback, cashbacks everywhere. Yes. <laughs> Make my trip 90% off hotels. Like, I don't know. Just say it's free. <laughs> uh, so, you know, just things like that, right? Um, and I think um, and I think the third most important thing that it does is I think it actually gives you a foundation on how you think about your company and your product evolving. Because yeah. growth is just helping you distribute the product, right? It's not building a whole new product. Right. So if you have a plan for it, then you know what features you want to prioritize, what features you don't want to prioritize. Right. A lot right? of this sounds like, I mean, what's a typical founder's vision, right? I, is it is it something which you think starts way back as early as a founder and his founding team figuring out where they want to be and how they want this to grow? And is it driven down from then? Because it, do, it seems like when you come in and, I mean... The second question was also what's the right time for a growth person to sort of join and or someone in the team to be nominated as yeah. the growth yeah. person. Uh, do you think like when this starts at the at a later stage in a company, uh, the person responsible is suddenly faced with the challenge of sort of figuring out, aligning all these teams together and having this one mindset and hoping that everything just works out? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, firstly, so, you know, so these are sort of the framework of growth, right? And, 
you're right that it starts with the vision of the founder because ultimately you're trying to distribute the product and product is the is the product, outcome yeah. of the vision of the founder right and so uh, it has to very well align most grow teams that are successful have good alignment uh, with their CEO or their founders right mm-hmm. because they need that buy in mm-hmm. if they don't mm-hmm. have that buy in it's you're not going to get very far um, and so uh, I do think it aligns uh, but I think that uh, formally having a grow team is probably a little bit later in the evolution of the company i think uh, the first aspect of growth is i think you need to figure out product market fit which uh, in growth language is retention right. uh, is if you don't really have retention having a grow team that's focusing on top of the funnel to just get more traffic more users is not Makes really meaningful sense. right yeah. and so i think whatever duration of time it takes for you to kind of find that product market fit uh, once you have a good intuition and a good handle on you know, what is the value your product is providing and that the users continue to use it over and over again and they continue to find that value over and over again, um, I think it's a good time to start to think about growth. So does it uh, does the scale of where you're at matter in that context or is it, uh, let's say, for example, you're a small app which is very specific but you have a lot of retention with your users, right? Uh, but at the same time, you want to start growing that a bit but your market is fairly small. So should you, should you put, uh, or your total market that's possible is fairly small. Should you put a lot of effort into growth at that point in time, or should you do? It, or is this stuff for which is more like kind of stuff with scales? So you know, one uh, trend that I've kind of noticed um, uh, from a growth perspective is um, products that are highly niche and have a very small TAM uh, with good retention mm-hmm. are typically products that have very high word of mouth. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and what that ends up happening is the organic growth just continues. Right. Uh, but then there'll be at some point where the organic will growth will stop. Yeah. Uh, but to to answer your question is, uh, I, I don't think there's sci- there's like a specific, okay, you need 1 million MAUs to start thinking no, about growth specifically. team. I'm just but I think, I, I do think that uh, you need to start thinking about what is the leverage your growth team can provide, right? If your major channels of acquisition so far have uh, only been, um, uh, have been word of mouth and uh, fairly organic in terms of other channels, uh, uh, what is your plan on answering this question of how is your product going to grow? And if the answer to that question is it is going to grow because of virality, it's going to grow because of some email marketing campaigns, some paid acquisitions, some content loops, stuff like that, then yes, you need a growth team. Yeah. Yeah. But if your answer is that, hey, I actually think that it's just always the product is well suited for it to be organic and be driven by, you know, distribution of social channels like Facebook and, Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and Google and whatnot, then I'm just going to continue having this one or two person team that kind of right. just, just focused on that, right? So I think that's what I'm saying. It's very important as uh, in terms of the framework of growth is to first really answer the question of how do you think your product is going to grow and kind of have initial alignment, at least within the founding team mm-hmm. on how they think about that growth, right? Mm-hmm. And then what that does is it actually gives you a perspective on uh, uh, what are the sets you require, uh, when is it a good time to start, uh, do you feel you are lacking or have some gaps even within the founding team, right, right. Uh, that you should hire uh, sooner than later? Yeah, I think also what I'm trying to understand and I think I'm believing uh, more and more is the mindset for growth is something you should have early on. You may not call it the growth team. It may still be the CEO or the guy who's responsible for, I mean, uh, even if you're a small company and you're still word of mouth, you can still do a little bit of marketing. You can still have, the way you do marketing can still be from a growth mindset. Right. Like the fact that, okay, I have to find product market fit first. What do I do to find that? What do I do to go out there? How do I talk to my customers? How do I talk to my users? That mindset is something which is uh, essential to being able to figure out growth later, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, I think, uh, mindset instead, and instead I, of just thinking, uh, oh, don't worry, I'll just, once I get some money, I'm just going to buy all my other users and it'll all work. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I definitely think that it's very important. Um, if you're in it for the long run, which hopefully you are as a founder, mm-hmm. uh, you are thinking about, uh, getting to scale in some meaningful way because you know the money is going to dry out pretty yeah. fast. But of course, when the money hits the bank, there is temptation to at least 
get some instant gratification on whether the product are working or not. And that's fair. And I think that should you should definitely leverage that because uh, mm-hmm. there's always first movers advantage. There's always mm-hmm. a bunch of other things that come with it. Um, but I think, uh, like I said, and I am going to sound like a uh, like a you know d- a dead box, but every I think unless you don't figure out product market fit, unless you don't have retention, it doesn't matter what dollars you spend. You're gonna you're yeah. just gonna be on. The, the short end of uh, the stick, right? So, right. Uh, but mindset is definitely important. I think it has, it typically comes from the founding team. Um, the importance of it, um, of how much you care about it uh, comes from the founding team. So mindset is definitely important. Uh, and also, uh, I think going back to the point you were making about it coming from founders, I think it's also an important aspect that people think about in uh, the growth leads that they hire. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think typical sort of um, yeah, typical uh, typical uh, characteristics that I've seen of successful people uh, doing growth is they're always curious. They're always asking why, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they're always they have hopefully they have little to no ego because eighty percent of what they do what they will do is going to fail, and mm-hmm. they they should be okay letting that go, right? Yeah, uh, you okay. can get you can get atta- attached to an experiment and somehow try to find data to support it that it works. Huh. Um, because it does happen yeah. very often. Um, yeah, you put a lot of effort into something and you're seeing marginal returns on it compared to what you're getting elsewhere. Yeah. You're like, maybe we can fix this. Yeah, you yeah. Know I mean? like that? yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then third is, um, I think uh, you have to have this uh, mindset of uh, persevering, you know, of being able yeah. to constantly keep trying till you find something. Uh, because maybe the second try you do something, you'll find something. Maybe it's 200 tries later. You don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the point is you need to be able to sustain that and persevere through it. Uh, and so typically, um, you know, their growth leads are, uh, or at least the product managers uh, for the growth teams are generally people that are uh, ex-founders in companies that have, you know, have the yeah. same kind yeah. of character that are kind of yeah. curious to ask why is this working? I was actually going to say that. Work? I mean, it sounds exactly like a founder role. Yeah. It is, it is. Actually. And um, a lot of companies, um, you know, when they start building out the growth teams, uh, they try to look for internal hires uh, that have those characteristics. Right. So they've been ex-founder somewhere, they're either right. acquired into this, have similar characteristics, and they try to hold them uh, there. Also, I think as, a, as somebody who's leading the growth team, it's extremely important that you have social capital and uh, ability to collaborate across different teams because mm-hmm. as a growth team, you're never going to have all the resources, right? right? Uh, you're going to touch a variety of different parts of the product. Uh, you're not going to build everything yourself. You're going to have to collaborate with other parts of the team. And you should be able to do that and communicate well uh, and prioritize that. I have a question cycling back a little bit to what yeah. you were saying about experiments. Um, now this might be a little too specific uh, to get a real answer out of, but I'd just like to know what you think yeah. about it. Are there too, Is there a possibility of doing too many experiments? Because a lot of these numbers that you'd be looking at, you'd be monitoring as you're doing an experiment, those might get kind of like, you know, mixed up in some ways between like you don't know exactly what is leading to what. So is there such a thing as doing too many different types of experiments at a time? Only when you have too much money, as we've seen with well, a lot of startups. Clearly. That that's not uh. my problem, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it just it, it it occurred to me when you were talking about that, right? Because yeah, I, uh, I do find sorry, uh, I do find a little bit of uh, difficulty in telling what channels leading to what, right? Because uh, and our numbers are still pretty kind of uh, clear in that sense. I know that this is coming from here, this is coming from here, this is coming from here, but I still find there is some overlap, and so that that uh, that I'm not really sure sometimes what's working and what's not working or how well something is working. So is there too much that you can do in that context? So I don't think there's such thing as too much experimentation, but okay. I do think there is such thing as just experimenting for the heck of experimenting, okay. right? Like mm-hmm. there are some things that you just know are not going to work, but right. you just want to prove a point and then you just kind of run an experiment. Mm-hmm. But going, the, going back to the point you were making on how do you, there are, there are times when you don't understand what's leading to either success or not. Right. Uh, I think it goes back to um, setting up the foundation of growth uh, right and what that what I mean by that is I think one of the most fundamental things about growth is making sure you have enough uh, you believe in how you're tracking your data mm-hmm. uh, there is a single source of truth mm-hmm. most companies as they scale you know marketing will look at Google Analytics product will look at some internal tool like Mixpanel, CleverTap, whatever it is and then um, uh, and then the CEO has his own dashboard Okay. Everyone ha- is looking at different sources of data. They all kind of somewhat say the same story, but 
only to kind yeah. of I- in a different way, right? And when you drill down, the difference is there's differences, there. right? Yeah. And yeah. those details are where uh, yeah. I mean, the devil is this, in the yeah. details, right? And yeah. that's where you get confusion on whether yeah. this is working or not working. So I think having that is fundamentally important uh, to set up a growth team. Mm. I think the second most important thing in terms of infrastructure that you can invest in is setting up the experimentation framework, right? What I mean by that is um, the most fundamental aspect of experimentation is how you divide uh, your user base to have, um, you know, to, to sort of have two different experiences to know which one is better, right? Mm-hmm. Most times what ends up happening is, um, is you know, let's say I'm running uh, a A-B test on uh, some content change, copy change, right? Um, and... It's just 50% of this user base sees copy X and the other one sees copy Y. And there's another experiment experiment that's running at the same time that's changed the sign of module to whatever. Mm. If I don't divide the user base right, um, th- there might be an implication of one to the other. Right. Yeah, uh, because which you don't want. Which you don't want, which right? Don't want, right? And so setting up the experimentation framework right where you have confidence in how you're actually running these experiments right. is way more important than running the experiments themselves. Okay. Uh, and if you have that confidence, uh, typically a good experiment framework will focus on a, a few things. One is uh, dividing your user base such that there's no conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, second is um, being able to determine statistical significance to know whether the results um, are something meaningful for you to actually uh, get make some decisions on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think third is uh, making sure that uh, people that are non-technical can continue to look at their data and yeah. make sense of it, right? right? Because you don't want to be kind of uh, bottlenecked by engineers and like, hey, do this analysis Explain for me and like me tell what's me, happening here, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so sort of communicating that and making that accessible to everyone yeah, in the organization. Uh, and I think once you have that, I think it kind of clears a lot of the doubts that you have, right? right. Uh, which what then ends up happening is you feel a lot more confident in the experiments you're running. Uh, you feel um, that, you know, one is the confidence in the experiments you're running and you know exactly why something is doing well and something's not doing mm-hmm. well, right? Um, the worst thing is metrics go up and you don't know why. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cuz then you're just like oh shit everything's working yeah. but it's really not <laughs> no, there's only no a few things why, yeah. yeah i think right? this is actually like a, i think there's a quote from Erst, uh, old yeah, school marketing from, right Ogarvi, david ogavi yeah half of my marketing is working i just don't know which half exactly and that holds true for the digital world of growth as well it does and it's unfortunate because uh, unlike the traditional mediums of marketing like tv and oh uh, digital is highly trackable mm-hmm. yeah. uh, is you should be knowing everything yeah. Um, yeah. i mean at least google does so yeah n- <laughs> So, and now, if you don't know what's working, that's your growth team's problem. Yeah, no, but I, I actually, you, you should, have a bad head if of. If you are growth. primarily digital, you should know what's yeah, working and what's yeah. not. Right? I mean, that's an older television time ka. Yeah, yeah, television, yeah. newspaper, whichever. Yeah. right? Yeah. And so I think uh, I think when you when you get to a point where you start to feel uh, like you're asking questions, like I'm not really sure what's working, what's not working, I think that's a good time to actually step back and think about: Am I tracking things right? right. Am I uh, bubbling things and rolling things um, in in the way I should be? Mm-hmm. Um, and um, you know, do I have the basic infrastructure uh, set up to think about growth at scale? Yeah. Wow. I think <laughs> it's a lot of schooling for us to go back and yeah, do I some know. homework. I on. think I need to listen to this episode again. <laughs> 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 and then figure out our growth story from here onwards. But, I mean, thanks so much for that, Mona. It's, it's, uh, I, I, I think uh, what you're gonna. I think what you should do next is pr- probably start coaching classes. <laughs> I should for uh, for all entrepreneurs for, uh, and founders. Basically, how do you go from being a growth hacker to a growth professional? Oh my god! Yes. I never want to be associated with anything growth hacking. <laughs> <laughs> I literally but, on my Twitter handle I said growth unhacker. <laughs> wow. But okay, so since you mentioned, where's where can we find you on Twitter? I'm just uh, Mona Gandhi on Twitter. Awesome. Uh, and you can. Talk to you DM, about yeah. uh, ask talk me to any about questions you have about growth and yeah. how to get there. Yeah. And but if you do take up the idea about coaching classes on growth, I think there'll be a lot of folks sure. who definitely who should sign up <laughs> because we clearly I'll hold you up to that. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, we, we'll both be, we'll both sign up. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we clearly think of uh, I mean. It's easy, and I, like I said, I've uh, being a founder, have done a bunch of stuff. It's easy to get carried away n- with immediately what's in front of you and sort of attack only those problems and not have a step back world view on how yeah. this will really grow up. Yeah. So 
thanks thanks for the inputs and uh, look forward to learning some more uh going yeah. forward from you uh, do join our slack channel where there'll be a bunch of folks who will be asking questions yeah you uh, can go there to the website ivmpodcast.com slash junior one over there there's a button saying subscribe to slack and subscribe to slack and we'll send you an invite and then join the conversation fantastic oh, oh yeah and also guys please itunes reviews or tune in reviews or wherever you're listening to please go and review uh, give it a rating give it a review whatever that is that would help all right. Thanks so much, Mona, for that uh, thrilling episode on schooling us. Uh, and like we had promised, I think this was episode 42, the yes. answer to life, the universe and everything. And uh, it was awesome. <laughs> and we did get the answers to everything. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Thanks. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys next week. See ya. Are you constantly seeking happiness? Wondering how to make the most of every day? How not to let your inhibitions stop you from achieving your goals? It's now time to get your A game on. It's time to unlock your true potential. Tune in to the empowering series with me Zarina Poonawala to feel empowered in all genres of life. From behavioral skills to management skills, from health to relationships, from mental well-being to emotional well-being and of course your finances i've got you covered with these tips and tricks from me zarina and true life stories from my amazing guests you're bound to bring your purest to the table tune in to the empowering series with zarina punawala every thursday on the ivm podcast app website or wherever you listen to podcasts Hey guys, I'm Mikhail Almeida. I host a, a podcast with my co-host Akash Mehta and Siddharth Reja on the IVM app. It's called What a Player. What, What a, a player. player. W A D D A P L A Y A H because illiterates can't find it on their own. No, and yeah. the h at the end is very important. What, What a player. player. Yeah. <laughs> and it comes out every Thursday on the IVM app. Uh, tune in. We discuss everything sports, uh, all sports, uh, all, sports. all sports. Yeah. <laughs> Mainly cricket, other sport in the middle sandwich. <laughs> What happened to your language skills? Thursday. Don't worry, he talks better on the show. Yeah, <laughs> it's so, a great show. It has all things, including cricket and uh, things around sports as well. Yeah, and some personal life. As you can see, we're a very united podcast. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to listen to us, tune in to us every Thursday on the IBM Podcast app or ibmpodcast. com.